This is a fairly standard C1 question on sequences on a recursion relation. And we have the first term is a constant k, a positive integer. And we have this relationship that tells me any term is given by 5 times the previous term plus 3. So part A is straightforward. The second term is simply 5 times the first term plus 3. So it's 5k plus 3. For part B, we want to work out the third term. So we do 5 times the second term, add 3. So it's 5 times what we've just uh, worked out. This is a show that, so be careful that you don't skip any steps. Multiply out the brackets and tidy it up, and you get the answer that they were looking for. Part C, the first part, <coughs> um, it wants us to work out this particular sum. And if you look at it, it's the sum of the first four terms in this series. Um, that means, well, we know the first three, so now we need to find the fourth term. So to do that, we do simply do five times the third term plus three. So five times our answer from part B, add three, multiply the brackets, tidy it up, 125k plus 93. That's my fourth term. But what I want is the sum from r equals one to four of a r. So I want a1 plus a2 plus a3 plus a4. Just add together all the answers that we've worked out so far. And don't forget a1, which is k, and we get that. That's our answer to part i. Now for part i i, um, we simply have to show, to show that it's divisible by 6, we have to show that it's a multiple of 6. So factorize it, and it comes out like this. And therefore, if it's a multiple of 6, it must be divisible by 6. Now, this is a fairly typical binomial expansion question. 3 plus bx to the power of 5. So, first term is always the first bit in your bracket to the highest power, 3 to the power of 5. Then we have 5 choose 1, 3 to the power of 4, bx to the power of 1. So we've introduced bx. The next one, 5 choose 2, 3 cubed, bx squared. And it would carry on. Note the brackets there. They're important. And I'm circling the powers here because in each term in the expansion, the sum of the two powers must be 5. OK, that's a good trick just to make sure that you get that right. <coughs> um, so 3 to the power 5 is 243. 3 to the power 4 is 81. 5 choose 1 and 5 choose 2. You can remember those from Pascal's triangle, or you can do them on your calculator. Make sure you write b squared x squared, OK, because you're squaring the whole of bx. After that, it's just tidying it up. Um, uh, to get your answer. So those are the first three terms in ascending powers of x. Part b is also fairly typical. We have this statement. Coefficient of x squared is twice the coefficient of x. And we need to ter interpret that um, and write down an equation. So the coefficient of x squared, well, looking at what we've just done, that's 270b squared, uh, is twice. Mathematically, we say that is therefore equal to 2 times. And the coefficient of x is simply 405b. So that gives us our equation. And when we tidy that up, 270b squared equals 810b. And usually, for an equation like this, we would say, be careful of dividing by b, uh, because you could lose a solution. In this case, you'd lose the solution b equals 0. But we're told in the question that b is non-zero. So we can divide by b, and that's no problem. So we simply get 210b is 810, divide through, get b equals 3. That's our answer. OK, so the car is losing 20% of its value each year. To lose 20% of your value, multiply by 0 0.8. That happens for three years, so it's 0 0.8 cubed. OK, you've done this sort of stuff at GCSE, so it isn't too much of a leap. And plug it into your calculator, you get exactly the answer that they're asking for. Part B. We have this statement, the value after n years is less than £1,000. Let's translate that into mathematics. So the value after n years, um, well, that's 18,000 times 0 0.8 to the power n. But like part a, but for n years, and we just have to write less than 1,000. So we get this inequality. If I divide through by 18,000, we can simplify that. 0 0.8 to the power n is less than 1 18th. Next step, because n is in the power, is to take logs of both sides. 
Okay, so n log 0.8 is less than log of 1 18th. And I'd use log to the base 10, that's the simplest one to use. Um, now, next step we have to take a little bit of care with. We're going to divide by log of 0.8. That's just a number. Okay, so we can divide by that, and that will leave n on its own on the left hand side of the equation. But we have to be careful because actually log of 0 0.8 is a negative number. Okay, anytime you're dividing by a log and you're not sure whether it's negative or positive, especially when you've got an inequality, you need to check. Because if you're dividing by a negative, well, you don't keep the same inequality sign. You need to cha change it. Okay, so we get rid of that less than and replace it with a greater than, and the rest we just stick in the calculator. Log of 1 18th divided by log of 0.8 and we get 12.952 dot, dot 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 n has to be greater than that and n has to be a whole number of years so it's 13. Right, part C uh, slightly different situation here cost in the first year is 200 pounds then the next year it's up by 12% each year up by 12% okay so the first term is A the common ratio while to increase by 12% you multiply by 1.12 that's the setup so the cost for the fifth year is simply the fifth term which is AR to the power of 4 from the common formula. And shove those values in, and we get uh, a value that we're looking for. Okay, and it says to the nearest penny, so around that to £314.70. <coughs> Part D, what's the total cost for the first 15 years? Well, that's the sum of the first 15 terms of this series that I've defined. So we're going to use this formula that you're familiar with, substitute in A and R, n and really it comes down to can you do this on your calculator so as long as you're familiar with your calculator and you practice this sort of formula it shouldn't be any problem at all now it doesn't state the accuracy to give it to so I'm going to round to three significant figures and that's it so this question starts off with a nice simple example of having to um, find the equation of a circle and we know the centre, but we need to know the radius to get the equation. So we're given the centre and a point on the circle, so the distance between those two is the radius. So using Pythagoras, r squared equals the difference between the x-coordinate squared and the difference between the y-coordinate squared. And that very easily gives us r squared is 100. And given that it also passes through 2, 1, we can pop those details straight into the standard equation. We don't even have to square root r squared because you would only need to square it again. Part b, we have a tangent uh, to this circle at a particular point. Okay, so the tangent is going to be perpendicular to the radius at this point. And so the line that we need, we're going to find the gradient using that fact, and we can use the fact that it passes through 10, 7. So let's see how we do that. Uh, first of all, to find the gradient of the radius at that particular point. We use the standard formula for the gradient, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So subtract the y values on top and the x values on the bottom, we get the gradient of 3 quarters for the radius, which means the gradient of the tangent, and therefore the gradient of my line, is the negative reciprocal of 3 quarters, i.e. minus 4 thirds. Okay, next we use the fact that it passes through 10, 7, and it has this gradient, which we have just worked out. Substitute it into your standard formula for the equation of a straight line. We know it passes through uh, 10, 7, so that's, those are the x and y values that I substitute in, as well as the gradient, which you can see there. And the simplest thing to do is to multiply by 3, then expand the brackets, then we can rearrange it all to put it in this nice, easy form. That is the equation of the line L1. Now, part C. Uh, at first glance, is tricky. Okay, we want a line that passes through the midpoint of AB and is parallel to L1. And then that line intersects my circle C at two particular points, and we need the distance between those points. So we're going to need the equation of the line, which means we need the midpoint of AB, which we'll call M. So let's start doing that. M is given by uh, adding, well, it's the mean of the x-coordinates and the y-coordinates of A and B. So 2 out of 10 divided by 2, 1 plus 7 divided by 2, that gives me my midpoint. So now we can think about working out the equation 
for line L2. First of all, we know it's parallel to L1. That tells me that its gradient is going to be minus 4 thirds from the previous part of the question. Um, I also know it passes through the midpoint. So that's what I've just calculated. It passes through 6, 4. So to work the equation out, same old, same old. Substitute in the values of the gradient and the point 6, 4. Play around with that, rearrange it. And we get this uh, terrific looking equation um, for L2. But now, there's a long road ahead because we have to find P and Q, and that's where this curve, this line, meets the circle. So we have to solve simultaneously. And C has got quadratic terms in it. It's going to be nasty, and there's only three marks. So it makes me think there's got to be an easier way to do it. And, well, of course, there is. And it helps to draw it. And a lot of the questions at the end of the exam papers, you'll find if you draw it, it makes a lot more sense. So here's a rough sketch of what's going on. I've got my circle. L1 is a tangent at B. The center is A. And I know the midpoint is where my second line passes through, L1. Sorry, L2. L2 passes through there, and it's parallel to L1. Now, if I draw in that right angle sign there, check that you are convinced that that should be a right angle. And if you're not sure why, ask me. But it is. And so I can label these points as P and Q. And if I draw in these lines here, these are radii. So I know some lengths on this diagram. I know, for example, that the radius is 10. So each of those is 10. Uh, M was the midpoint of those, so that is going to be 5. And lo and behold, I've got a couple of identical, or rather uh, congruent, right angle triangles. So Pythagoras' theorem is all I need here. PM squared plus 5 squared is 10 squared. Solve that. Um, we get for PM the square root of 75, which simplifies to 5 root 3. And so PQ is simply two lots of that, 10 root 3. Definitely easier than the other way. OK, so the key to this question is to be able to take the facts that we're given and write them down mathematically. So if the second term is 750, AR, because it's AR to the n minus 1, is 750. Likewise, the fifth term is minus 6, so we can write a r to the power 4 equals minus 6. And all we're doing here is dividing one equation by the other as a means of solving, because the a's cancel out, the r on the bottom cancels with one of the r's on the top, and we're simply left with r cubed. And nicely enough, it's a nice cube number, so we take the cube root of minus 1 over 125, we get minus 1 fifth. Um, part B, to find A, we substitute back into the first equation. You could really put it in either equation. I put it in that one, and you rearrange by multiplying by minus 5 to give minus 3,750 for your first term. Finally, just the sum to infinity formula. Learn it. Make sure you know it. Substitute in carefully, making sure you don't make a mess of the negative numbers. So 1 minus minus a fifth is 6 fifths. If you divide that, minus 3,125. And that's it. Done. OK, so the examiner has been quite kind to you here because he's asking you to sketch a cubic, um, but it's already factorized. So straight away, we can consider where it crosses the x-axis. And that would be when x equals 0 from that factor, from x equals minus 2 from that one, and x equals plus 3 for that one. If you're not sure why, think about that whole bracket being 0 and what value x would have to be for that to work. The general shape, if you were to multiply that out, you'd get a negative coefficient of x cubed. So that means we get one of these ones. We get a down, up, down. Now, we already know because it crosses the x-axis at x equals naught, that tells me it goes through the origin. Therefore, the y-axis intercept is also at naught. But if we wanted to calculate that, um, we would substitute x equals 0 into the equation, and that would give us y equals 0. The next one to sketch is a reciprocal graph. Um, because it has a minus sign in front of it, we know it looks like this. There are no specific points to calculate because it doesn't cross either of the axes. So, we can draw our cubic like that. We know the shape, and we can label the points it passes through, minus 2, 3, and 0. Oops, don't forget to label your axes. And then don't forget also 
as I'm doing here to label your graphs um, which one is which. Um, in any case we can now add the drawing for our reciprocal graph and that A done. Oh yeah, don't forget to label your graph. For part B, consider carefully the significance of these two points I'm labeling now where the graphs meet. At those points x brackets x plus 2 bracket 3 minus x must be equal to minus 2 over x. That's an equation and if you rearrange it you get the equation that they're giving you. So the fact that these meet in two places means that our equation has two solutions and that's all there is to it.